And that's the way that it happens sometimes. We would like it to always look like if we were in battle, we want to look like Braveheart. If we're a worship leader, right, that's the scene that we want. You know, will you praise God with me tonight, people of the Lord? You know, you've got to speak in a British accent if you're a really cool worship leader, right? You can't just have an American accent. There's got to be something like, the Lord, you know. <laughs> People are getting slain, you know, people's legs are growing out. Like, that's the scene we have in our head. People are repenting, they're coming back to the Lord, and it just doesn't always work out like that. Um, when I was leading the SBS here one year, we sat down in the staff training time just to talk about who was going to do which particular areas of the school ministry. Who's going to be in charge of hospitality, work duties, always a favorite, blah, 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 on and on and on. And so we come down to it and we say, okay, who's going to be in charge of worship? And we start going around the circle because some of them were new staff. It's like, I can't lead worship. Can you lead worship? No, I can't lead worship. Have you ever led worship? No, I've never led worship. I can't sing at all. And we're like, uh-oh. We're in a little bit of trouble here. But none of us on staff have ever led worship before. And so then one of the staff said, oh, don't worry about it. There's always students. There's always students. It's a YWAM school. Of course we're going to have students that can lead worship. This is not always the case in an SBS because we, we tend to attract Bible nerds. <laughs> Bible nerds don't always get out very much and learn new skills. So... <laughs> We got, these, we got these 25 students, and out of 25 students, 25 students, you know how many worship leaders we had? Zilcho! No, God, why would you do this to us? We're YWAM. We have to have worship leaders. There's just got to be. What are we doing wrong? So, you know, we beg, borrow, and steal some worship leaders, but we can't cover our full schedule. You know, School of Worship was helping us out. We didn't really have a worship department, kind of like you do now. Um, and so we've got all these open dates. Well, I was about 31 years old. And when I turned 30, I decided if I'm ever going to be able to play an instrument, I have to start now or it's going to be too late. Like, there's some sense. Jesus' ministry started when he was 30. I'll miraculously be a musician at the age of 30. So I went to Costco. I bought a guitar. And I tortured my family for months on end. And... Uh, Basically, yeah, he likes that. Basically, what I found out is that I can be about like a trained monkey when it comes to playing the guitar. I can learn a few chords and about two strums. So if a worship song was in one of those five chords, or if it, I could use one of those two strums, I could fake my way through it a little bit. And so I was just like, okay, I'm the reject YWAM school leader who can't also lead worship. Because right? if you're a YWAM school leader, it's an automatic assumption. And I just could not. And yet, we didn't have a choice. We're like, we, we have to have worship. So my staff were like, okay, well, you just, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to lead worship. And so we scheduled myself in for like twice a quarter. And they were the most humiliating times of suffering I have ever been through. I'd rather be back in that birthing room and watch poop come out of my wife than ever lead worship again. I mean, I made all the... And we've all had that. You've all had the rookie worship leaders, the people who maybe aren't really gifted but think they are, and you're trying to, again, kind of help encourage them. I made every single rookie worship leader mistake. Right from the uh, this song really requires a different strum that I know, but this is the only strum that I know, and so it's just off the whole time. So everybody's constantly singing at a different timing than I am. Like your love, your love, your love. There's like three different. It's like a chorus, right? It's like a round. Everybody's singing because nobody knows when you're when you're supposed to sing. That isn't when he's singing. I, I had um, the uh, other favorite, which is, I think I'm singing at the right key, but clearly I am not. So, you know, like the guys are all trying to sing like this really low, and all the girls have to sing this high to try to match whatever I'm doing, right? My favorite personal one was the actually stops right in the middle of the song. <laughs> Like almost every time, at least on one of the songs, right? Father of, and I just, just melt down, just nothing. I forget the next song lyric. I forget the next 
cord, I'm at, just meltdown. And there's nothing more awkward, right? Then you're trying to sing and worship, and the, the worship leader just melts down in front and just stops singing and stops playing the guitar, you know? And um, praise the Lord, the next year I made sure to recruit someone. I didn't care if they could teach the Bible. I don't care if they even read the Bible. <laughs> but they were the best worship leader I'd ever seen. So I never had to do it again. I literally have not touched my guitar probably in the last five years. It's kind of sad. But, okay. For that time period, is there something now? Sorry. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> not going to happen. For the <laughs> wouldn't be prudent at this juncture. I, I, I say all that to say that I was doing what God wanted me to do. Like, it would have been great if I had Dave Crowder on my uh, leadership team or Matt Redman or one of those guys, but I didn't. There was nobody else, and there was a need. God knew you can't go through and keep studying the Word. You can't even live if you don't have worship. You've got to be able to express your gratitude and praise the Lord for His character and nature and respond to what it is that you're seeing in these pages. So I don't care how bad you are, at least people were able to worship. And so I didn't get to look like this. I got to look like the left-handed bathroom stabber. <laughs> Right? And sometimes it literally felt like I was pooping on the floor musically. And yet God used it. And sometimes I even had, I don't know if this was out of pity or it really, really meant it. I would have students come up at the end of the year or a student came up at the end of that year and said, you know, I know you don't feel like you're good at leading worship, but I really enjoyed the worship times because it just like was simple. You know, it wasn't complex. You didn't have like a whole team up there. It just kind of brought me back to the simplicity of what worship is supposed to be about. We're going to talk about that on Friday, which is about the heart. And so as lame as I felt in that, and thank God he's never asked me to do it again, I still had to be willing to do it. Because it's not about us looking heroic. We don't respond to the call so that we look like that. Sometimes maybe it, it'll be the case. But we do it because we love God and we love other people. And there's a need, and it needs to be served. And nobody else is lining up to do it. So let's take our next break. We'll take a five-minute break. And then when we come back, we'll uh, talk about Deborah. Woman power. I've experienced the, uh, I've experienced the song and sing a cappella. Yeah. Which you can it's sometimes play it off. A, like, I, I really meant to stop playing. Uh, the Lord's focusing. There's just a moment there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so great. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Justice of God thing. Mm -hmm. I, just to follow. Um, I was just out under the stars, walking with God, and mm -hmm. talking with Him. And I just like, first I started praying. I'm like, Lord, I pray. And I was like, why, why do I talk like that? When I'm just with God, like, mm -hmm. I started talking real. I was like, can you answer my questions? Like, these mm -hmm. questions I have, you just like, can I have you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, it's just, I don't usually hear Him very clearly, mm -hmm. but being here, these, there's like, He's just really speaking to me and asking awesome. me questions. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, and they always cut to the heart of it. Mm. So I just want to let you know, because your teaching, you know, initiated that whole process. And mm. so Praise God. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Welcome. Excuse me. Sorry. John. Yes. Another question. Yes, sir. What? Is this the same Jephthah that was mentioned in Hebrews? Yes. <laughs> But you, if you if you go down that road, you got to say is is it the same Lot who's mentioned in Hebrews? And I'm not in Hebrews, but um, he's mentioned in um, righteous law, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Jude or Second Peter. I think it's Second. Momentary. I think it's Second Peter chapter three. Yeah, where it calls Lot a righteous man. 
I mean, Lot's called a righteous man. In um, Galatians 3, Paul's speaking of Abraham, and he says, Abraham, who never wavered in the faith. Yeah. Like, Abraham was full of mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I think I see some wavering. Uh, what do you call Hagar? That's a lot of wavering. Uh, yeah. Lot is a righteous guy. I kind of, I don't know if I see that. God just bails him out because of Abraham. Uh, and I think it's not like a cynical person would say it's like a cover-up. You, you know what I mean? I think a... Um, a realist would say that none of us is a hero. None of us is worthy of any accolade that God could give, even Billy Graham, because it's all grace. And so as we're covered under the grace of Christ, the cross of Christ, it says literally God doesn't remember those sins anymore. Those sins are removed and we're seen as a new creation. We're seen in the image of God and what we were supposed to be. So I, th I think... It's that, like, Hebrews 11 is seeing Jephthah through the eyes of the cross. Uh, Galatians 3 and Romans 4 is seeing Abraham through the light of the cross. A uh, lot in Second Peter, if that's where it is. Eyes of the cross. Yeah. Another question. Yep. Back when we talked about, like, last night, is open pizza heresy? Or what do you think? I absolutely think that. It's heresy? Yeah. I think that... To me, a helpful thing is to think of your doctrine as circles. So you've got the circle in the middle that's the core of Christianity. And that's like Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus died on the cross for the gifts. Those are absolutes. They're just, you know what I mean? They, we can't disagree on them and call ourselves Christians. Uh, to me. Yeah, I hear you. And I would put in that core into the character and nature of God, His sovereignty and His power. So we might, uh, the at next circle is the things that we might feel strongly about, but I could agree to disagree and still call you a Christian. Uh, women teachers, um, gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, eschatology. I feel strongly about them, but I could disagree with you and still say you're a Christian. And then I have that outer circle, which is like question mark. I mean, I just don't, I don't know if we can even have a strong opinion on them. They're just questions that we're going to have. For sure, man. And, and so the, the history of the church is deciding what goes in what circle. The denominations basically take that inner circle and they just make it go bigger and bigger. Like the Roman Catholic Church, their circle is huge. But in YWAM, we're actually doing the opposite. But I just, I put that in the middle of the circle. Is it's just too clear from Scripture. I know, I mean, And it just changes everything about who God is. I even so. heard, what gets me is like some SPS bases around the world have that. Because it, they feel like it goes with missions. If God is sovereign and He's in control and He has destined everyone to either destruction or to salvation, what are we doing in missions? Why does it matter? Why am I going to risk my life to go to the Amazon, my kids' lives, for what? And so an Arminianist um, moral, and then all the way into moral government, all the way to open theism, it kind of makes us think, well, God's just limiting himself through the power of the church. If we don't do it, God is God could do it, but he's not going to. He has put that in our hands, and they pull up lots of verses that they can use for that. And... Um, you know, but those verses don't cancel out the other ones. Yeah. The problem is that you've got a, you've got a paradox. You've got a called an oxymoron, whatever. Yeah. The Bible says that God is in control and sovereign, and that man has free will and is accountable. Sure. There's no philosophical or logical way to bring those fully together. And so, I think for some people, the one that at least is a better motivator for missions is an Arminianist moral government or open theistic thought. It boggles the mind, man. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's the thing, is that when you look at it, you can have a theological, biblical response, but then you need the practical side of it. Like I remember reading through one of the main guys who wrote about this is a guy named uh, John Sanders. He's one of the big open theists. His older brother was his hero, and he was a rock star, righteous youth group leader in his 20s, dies in a motorcycle accident. And people came up to him after his brother died and said, well, God's got a plan. God's in control. And that's what started his journey that ended him in open theism. 
because he couldn't accept a view of God that allowed his brother to die. He couldn't see how that would ever fit into God's plan. Not that joke mentality, huh? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that's how you connect it with this more than just an intellectual disagreement. Just like the missions thing. Yeah. That's just, so. I don't know, I'm still like ruminating. I mean, not down here towards that way. It's just like, yeah. somebody. It's crazy. Yeah, there's some really smart guys who believe that. They're not idiots. Gregory Boyd, John Sanders, Clark Pinnock. And it doesn't mean everything they've written is garbage. Of course, it's just... Um, I hear you, man. Yeah. Okay, let's get started again. All right, so we've looked at God using Othniel. He's, again, kind of the prototype. He's the one that encourages us that you can actually respond to God's call. You can be empowered of the Spirit. You can accomplish things and not have some massive meltdown, fight against God, um, you know, kind of testimony. That, that it is possible to really pursue the Lord. Um, then we had Ehud, and Ehud encouraged us, again, in the God can use anyone, and when he does, we don't always come out looking great, because that's not God's point. God's point, again, is not that we look heroic, but that we accomplish the salvation task that he sets before us. So are we willing to humiliate ourselves in order that others might be set free? That's the calling of God question we get from Ehud. Now we're on to Deborah and Barak. And uh, again, um, for especially the women in the class, as you get into this, this is so key in the Old Testament. It, it really is. Uh, today we tend to take for granted women's status in society, particularly in the West or in advanced countries in Asia. Uh, for example, in my uh, home country now of Taiwan, the next presidential election, one of the main candidates is a woman. Um, her name is Tsai Ing-wen, and she's running for president. She actually ran for president last time and was narrowly defeated by uh, Ma ying by a man. But it was a close race, and so she's running again. And when you, when, you, when you think about that, you could say, oh, well, of course, I mean, we have Hillary, Hillary Clinton running probably for the president of the United States. Women are CEOs now. Uh, they're in charge of multi-billion dollar companies. And yet, when I stop and think about the history of Taiwan and the history of China, and think that maybe only about 100 years ago, they were still binding women's feet in Chinese culture like literally crushing their foot bones to the point where they were unable to walk any distance because women were only valued for how they looked. And women are supposed to have tiny feet. I'm sorry to my wife who has a size 11 women's shoe. She basically cannot buy shoes in Taiwan. She doesn't even ask anymore. I mean, she can't, she can't even almost find men's shoes in her size in Taiwan. <laughs> And um, no, she's not Sasquatch or Bigfoot. She's just she's got a big foot. All right. So, <laughs> and um, just erase that part from the, yeah, erase that part from the video. My point is, all right, my wife's just taking a beating this morning. Um, my point here is, and I really love her, she's amazing. My point is, <laughs> my, my point is, I'm really digging a deep hole. <laughs> Um, my point is, is that only a hundred years ago they were crushing women's feet. And now you've got a woman running for president. And when you look at that change, I challenged my English class one night when we were discussing this in our discussion time. I challenged my Taiwanese English class, why has it changed? You tell, you've seen this radical change because half of my English classes are uh, made up of women. One of them is, again, uh, a kind of up-and-coming person in uh, a corporation that uh, sells power drinks and that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, another one of them is a nurse at the local hospital. Another one of them is the head of a department at a public school. And so I said, okay, well, what's changed? And all of them said, oh, it's the influence from the West. 
because of our alliance with uh, the West and that we needed that to survive against the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the forces that we were allied against, um, that Western influence has brought this cultural change. And so women now are allowed to do all this stuff because we followed your pattern in America and in Europe. And I said, okay, well, where did that come from? Because if you look at Anglo culture, if you trace it back to Europe and go back to uh, the Germanic tribes, if you go back to the Vikings, uh, they didn't always treat women very nicely. <laughs> they, they haven't always allowed women to have status and to have ability to work outside the home. So what changed the West? And finally, I was able to get them back to the point and say, really, what changed things in Western culture and now what's changing things in Asian culture can be traced back to the Word of God. It can be traced back to Jesus Christ. And as you get into the New Testament and you see how Jesus interacted with women, it is radical. And today we just kind of glance over it. We just read Luke chapter 8 verse 1 and several women accompanied Jesus as he traveled and provided for them out of their own means. And we're like, eh, so he's got a couple of women traveling and they provide money. What's the big deal? It was huge back then. Women didn't travel with men. They certainly didn't travel with a Jewish rabbi. You would have never seen that happening. And the fact that Jesus is accepting money from these women, that they've got that influence into his ministry, unheard of. The Mary Martha story was a cultural bomb. Jesus just rolled up a grenade into the midst of the male disciples who were around and just blew them up. And so uh, we need to get in touch with the revolution that both the New and the Old Testament give about women. And Deborah is a reminder that it's not just like when Jesus came, he tried to correct things and God never cared about women before then. It's just not true. Because we read the Old Testament and we see the abuse of women, just like we do at the end of Judges. And we think, wow, where is God in the midst of that? But when you read the Pentateuch and then you read stories about women like Deborah and you read stories about women like Ruth and you read stories about women like Esther and you get it. You get the, the value that God has always placed on women. It's us. It's sinful humanity that has oppressed, neglected, raped, and abused women. And the sad thing is, is that even though Jesus started that cultural revolution in the first century, the early church walked away from it. The early church so quickly, by the second century, the early church was already walking away from Jesus' revolution and not allowing women to be in, in ministry roles. To the point where it had to start a new revolution all over again in the 1900s in Western civilization. Protestant Reformation didn't touch this either. It's still the men stayed in control and women had no ability to do ministry or hold ministry positions. It's only been in recent times that the church went back to the Word of God, went back to the heart of God and His plan for women in ministry. So we can argue, and the church can argue about marriage. How does marriage work? We can talk about headship and, you know, is there any authority roles in the marriage? And you could still legitimately argue and look at scriptures. But there is no way, no way that you could argue that God's plan isn't for men, women in ministry. And so as we look at Deborah, it is significant for that fact. Now, what we need to do then is kind of step back into their time period. As we step back into their time period, we said that Ehud is kind of the beginning um, kind of sign to us that God doesn't always choose who we think he should choose. He chooses left-handed people. And now, even though we're quite used to women being in ministry, at this time, it is a patriarchal society. All of the main leaders of Israel up to this point, as you've read through from Genesis, have pretty much been men. Abraham, Father Abraham, right? It was Noah was the main leader of his generation. And then it passed down through the line to, again, Isaac and then Jacob and then Joseph. And then it went to Moses and then Moses hands it off to Joshua. So up to this point in the story, yeah, we've seen women in the story, 
We've seen Sarah exerting influence. We've seen Miriam as a prophetess. But really the head or the main leadership of the God's people were always men. And that was their culture. That is the ancient Near East culture of those times. You just did not have women leaders. And when we get to here and God starts describing the next leader through the author, chapter 4, verse 1, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. And it keeps kind of going to the point where we're expecting for God to raise up a judge. That's the next part of the cycle. And so it says further down, verse 4, Now Deborah, a prophetess, and it goes on to describe what she was doing, and it says she was judging Israel. And if you are an original audience, if you are a Jew, a man at this point, like you just hit the brakes. You're like, Aah! right? Whoa, I know I didn't just read that right. Like, why is he even bringing up Deborah at all? Why? I mean, we're supposed to be introducing, remember the cycle, the sin, the slavery. Now he should be raising up a man to do a man's job. And why are we talking about Deborah? And then it tells us not only that she's a prophetess. Okay, we can let that one go. Miriam was a prophetess. We can let him go around and hit tambourines. I will sing unto the Lord for, you know, right? Well, they can do that kind of stuff. <laughs> But they can't do this. They can't be judging. And she is sitting under this palm tree and people are coming to her and she is resolving tribal conflicts, family conflicts. She is deciding upon matters of the law. And even though for us, again, this is enabling for the women, for them, I think they'd be embarrassed. I think for them, they would ask the question, where's the righteous men? Where, why does God have to raise up a woman to do this job? Where are the Joshuas? Where are the Othniels? Where are the Calebs? And that's definitely the way this story seems to, to take us. Because a few verses down, again, it tells Deborah what she's supposed to do. And she's supposed to call this man. Right? She's supposed to call this guy named Barak. Uh, would someone read, uh, let's see, I think this is, someone read verses eight and nine for us of chapter four. Eric told her, I will go, but only if you, wait, is that one? Yes. Mm -hmm. I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied. I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Eric to Kadesh. All right, so at this point in the story, Right? She's, she's called up the man to do a man's job. Barak, come. You will lead the armies of the Lord and go and conquer. And Barak's answer is just completely embarrassing if you're a Jewish man. He's like, um, I'll go if you go. <laughs> right? Like, what a weenie. Are you kidding? You're going to drag this woman into battle. Like, no, you're supposed to go, no, you stay back here. I will go and fight the bad guys. No, stand behind me. I will protect you, you know, right? That's what a hero is supposed to do. And what's he doing? He's pushing her in front of him. Like, I'll go if you go and you lead things. And the way that Deborah responds makes it clear that he lacked courage, that he lacked faith, that he was fighting the call of God. He didn't at all want to fulfill this role. He still wanted Deborah to kind of be the front person, the one calling the shots, the one commanding. And that's what she ends up doing. And God, she says, is going to judge him because of his lack of courage, his lack of faith, his lack of willingness to do what God calls him. He says, okay, you're going to go and we will get the victory. Israel will win, but you'll get no glory. There won't be anything that you can brag about. Because God will bring the victory through the hand of a woman. That actually what happens with Jael and the tent peg is because of Barak's cowardice. So that's why I called this story, it's really beauty and the coward. And, and once again, we're challenged. Right? Israel is supposed to be humiliated by this part of the story. But God gets the glory again, because even though this guy is just a total weenie, he wants women to go and do his fighting for him, God still sends some kind of rain, torrent, 
In chapter 5, the poem makes it clear that there's this huge flood almost that happens in the valley. And what the flood does is it turns the whole field of battle into sloppy mud. The advantage that King Jabin had was his chariots. He had chariots of iron, and iron is extremely rare at this time. We are in the Bronze Age still. We're not fully into the Iron Age. The Philistines are the one who have that understanding of metallurgy, and they're not here yet until towards the end of the book. So they have these big iron chariots. They roll out like it's their form of the tanks. God causes a flash flood, and all the chariots just, right? They just get stuck in the mud. And the horses are trying to pull them out, and the Israels just come up, right? Cut the hamstrings of the horses, kill the charioteers, and King Jabin loses his military advantage. And who gets the glory in that story? It's all God. God's the one who controls the rain. Do you see the irony there? Who are they worshiping instead of God? Baal. Baal is the god of what? The storm, the rain. Remember, it's his semen, the gross, icky part of their mythology. And yet God says, Baal doesn't even exist, and he surely does not have the power that I have. If I want it to rain, it rains so much there's a flood, and these chariots get stuck in the mud. So God is not just getting all the glory for a victory. He's also declaring himself in the same way that he did in the Exodus with the plagues. Each of those plagues was against a certain Egyptian god who was supposed to control the Nile or supposed to control the sky or supposed to control the frogs. And so it's, it's a power play. It is a declaration of who is the true powerful god. And the only other thing that Barak could have been left with as a, a glory from the battle is to be able to hold up the king's head, right? Hold up the bad king and go, or hold up his general and go, aha, I am victorious. And he doesn't even get that. In fact, again, Sisera is running away from the battle and he stops trying to find a place to hide. And it tells us earlier in the story that Jael's family are sellouts. They've made an alliance with this Canaanite king. And that's why they're living off in kind of safety and prosperity. And Jael obviously doesn't agree with her father's decision. And so she lets him in. He comes in and he's really sleepy. I mean, he has been fighting a battle. He's been working really hard. She gives him some warm milk, starts to sing him a lullaby. All right, go to sleep. Little bam, 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 right? <laughs> and drives a tent peg into his head. You're like, wow. <laughs> Okay, I, I don't know how many of you have actually tried to drive a wooden tent peg through someone's temple. Hopefully none of you. <laughs> but I understand from the medical research, it would not have been easy. Like, especially that first hit, they probably wake up. Okay, there's intense shooting pain in their head. Right, so, I don't know, even this picture, she kind of looks all dainty. I picture JL as like kind of a muscular woman. Picks up this tent peg and then just hammers down. Right? I, I know two families, Christian families, uh, that work with me in missions. They both named their daughters JL. And I always kind of think, what prophetic statement are you really making <laughs> with naming your daughter JL? But at least the, the point here is that she gets the glory. She's the one who takes the general out. And, and so I think it's kind of a double move of God. One is a slap in the face of the men. And it's basically saying that you know, because you fall back, because you are not willing to walk out your God-given call, you're going to be humiliated. You won't get the glory. And the other side, it's an empowerment for the women. It's an empowerment that says, in a society that dominates you, in a society that oppresses you, I can use you to get the glory. And your name, your name will be sung and praised for thousands of years. I mean, we are literally still talking about what an amazing woman Deborah was. And we are still reading over the song in chapter 5 and singing about what an amazing woman J.L. was who stood up for what was righteous, stood up for justice, and God used them to get the job done. Uh, one of the things that I am proud of in the 17 years that I served with YWAM is that one of YWAM's platform teachings, characteristics, if people said, what is YWAM known for? I guarantee you people are going to say it's for women in ministry. I mean, if you don't believe in women in ministry, then I would suggest you get out of YWAM. <laughs> 
You are, I always, I never can believe it when I encounter people in YWAM, even in the SBS, who are against women teachers and women in ministry. I'm like, what are you doing? Go somewhere else. Why would you come here? I mean, one time Judy Smith came to teach 1 Corinthians and three guys stood up and walked out because they were objecting to female teachers. And I just went to them afterwards. I'm like, get out. Like, literally, get off campus. Get out. If you don't believe in women in ministry, you, that's your choice, but you are in the wrong, wrong, wrong missionary organization. Because from the very beginning, it's Lauren and Darlene. It's Lauren and Darlene. It's not just the Lauren show. And he is the first one to praise the gifts that God has put into his wife and to talk about all the things that God has done through her. It's, and it's not Ron who started the SBS. Ron Smith did not start the SBS. Ron and Judy Smith started the SBS. And uh, Judy has one of the most powerful teachings on women in ministry and uh, is an amazing Bible teacher and one of my personal mentors in Bible teaching and in doing missions. And again, the ministry that I have is a direct result of Ron and Judy's work in the pioneering. But if you talk to Judy, she'll tell you about the battle stories. She'll tell you about all the disrespect that she has had to endure over all the years. And Ron will tell you how in their seminary class at Gordon-Conwell, like, there were just no other women. Judy, oftentimes in a class, was one of the only women in the class. And so because of her courage to walk out the call, to believe that God could use her, even though she was a woman in a society that did not look favorably on women teachers, there have been a whole wave of female Bible teachers that she has trained, risen up, and released to the nations. And SBS, I am proud to say, is a place where there's lots of amazing female Bible teachers and leaders. Not just teachers on staff, but leaders who pioneered schools in places like Ukraine and Nepal and other places that are very, very difficult to go. So this is part of our heritage. I think it's, it's part of who we are. And it's part of, again, this story that God can use anyone at any time, no matter even if the culture says you can't use that person. You can't use that gender. You can't use that ethnicity that does not limit our God and his call. All right, so as we finish this morning, we're going to finish with Gideon. And as I said when I did the walk through the big picture of the book of Judges, Gideon is the, the turning point in the book. He's kind of the hinge in the book. And even though he is largely successful in delivering the people of God, and his story starts out uh, pretty well as far as him being obedient to the call of God eventually, his story ends pathetically. That the same guy who will pull down the altar to Baal in his hometown is the same guy who will make the ephod. And, and really, when you even read that story, anybody have like a sense of deja vu? Like, give me all your gold, all your earrings, we're going to melt them down and we're going to make them into an idol. What story is that reminiscent of? The golden calf. Like, okay, I, I get it. Maybe if you're not a Bible scholar, uh, Gideon, but it seems like just a cursory knowledge of your people's history. Like maybe one of the most famous stories, like the golden calf, you'd learn something from that. He's doing the exact same thing. There's a famous expression that those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it. And, and that is the church's problem. Those who are ignorant of the Bible will just repeat the same mistakes that God's people have been making for thousands of years. And Gideon is, is definitely falling into that category. So Gideon, what do we learn from his call? What happens? When God uh, approaches Gideon, the oppression is so bad. Like the, the enemy people are stealing all their grain, all their crops. So they've got to figure out how do we thresh the wheat so that the enemy doesn't know we've harvested the wheat so that they can come and steal it. So they have the idea, let's go down inside this well, down deep in where they can't see me, and I will thresh the wheat down there. And I'll hide down in this well while I'm threshing wheat. That has got to be probably one of the most miserable things to experience. 
Because when you thresh the wheat back then, they still do it in some places in Israel the same way. You take the wheat and you toss it up into the air so that as it comes down, you can thresh the wheat. You can, again, sift out the grain heads from the stalks of the wheat. So if you're in out in the open air, all the dust and all the mold from it can just kind of, it's bad, but at least it disperses. If you're down inside of a well and you're going up like this, it's just coming down on your head. So the picture of Gideon is a completely emasculated man. There is nothing going right in his life. He's just sitting there, just hating life. Right? It's just going on his head. He is sneezing. He's coughing. He's gagging. My dad was a farmer. I understand how gross the dust can be off of crops, especially crops that have been harvested and are sitting there for a while. My dad's got like serious nasal problems from that. So Gideon is not happy. And when the angel of the Lord appears to him, that's what Gideon says. He's like, where is God? Right? Where is God? Why has God allowed this to happen to us? Now, to me, what this shows is not just Gideon's attitude, but Gideon's ignorance. Because who built the altar to Baal in Gideon's hometown? His dad! <laughs> well, can God use anyone? Can God use the son of a Baal worshiper? The son of a Baal altar builder? Definitely, God can do that. But he should have known. There should be no question why God has allowed them to fall into oppression. A cursory knowledge, again, of Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, it should be a no-brainer. We are being oppressed because we're breaking God's covenant. It's not a mystery. God made it that clear, but the people of God, if they don't know His Word, if they don't know His standards, they will blame God for stuff that's their own fault. And that is also a trend that will continue down through the generations of Israel. So what is Gideon's reply? Let's look. God comes and he calls him. Let's see if he has the Othniel reply. Would someone read chapter 6, verse 15? But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. All right, so... Gideon, we understand his response. I mean, he feels powerless. So it's not just that he's down threshing wheat and hiding out. That doesn't make you feel manly. It's that he sees his tribe and uh, his clan as being one of the weakest at that point in Israel's history. They, they haven't proven themselves overly strong. Uh, they are in a very weak, probably economic position. And so, of course, it's kind of a natural question for him to ask. But basically what he's saying to God is, God, I can't do what you're calling me to do. You want me to deliver the people? Don't you know who I am and who I'm not? I'm from the weakest clan, the weakest tribe. God, I can't do it. So what Gideon is really saying to God is, here I'm not. Don't send me. Send somebody else. We call this the Moses reply. <laughs> God comes to Moses and he calls Moses to deliver the people. And Moses says, here I'm not, send my brother. <laughs> here I'm not, send my brother. Right? We'll just rewrite that worship song. <laughs> and so it's this trend of people who are just like, when God calls them, they're like, eh. And sometimes we have to wonder, is it really that they don't believe that they can do it? Or is it they're just like, um, that sounds like a horrible job. I will pass. Thank you very much. I'm not so sure if Moses and Gideon, a part of it is that they just don't want to do it. They know how difficult it's going to be. They're not so sure if God can come through. And so their first response is no. But see how God works with Gideon. God works with Gideon to give him supernatural confirmation after supernatural confirmation. I mean, the list keeps growing. We call this the, the fleecing Kind of the fleecing challenge. So the first thing is, an angel of the Lord comes to give this personal call to Gideon. Anybody had the angel of the Lord appear in a physical form to you? Anyone? Anyone? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> but if he did, I think I would be impressed. Right? I think I'd probably go, mm, yeah, I think God is calling me into missions. Because the angel of the Lord just appeared to me. That's significant. 
But Gideon's like, uh, can you stay and maybe do some kind of sign to make me sure that you're really the angel of the Lord and I'm called? And so he says, go and bring out some bread and an offering. He sets that out. The angel of the Lord tips the staff over. Whoosh! Fire comes up and consumes everything on the altar. Anybody had divine fire go out and consume an offering that you just placed on an altar? Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> Not me personally, but again, I think I'd be fairly impressed if fire just miraculously sprouted up and like destroyed something in front of me. I go, okay, God, you got me. All right, you really are God. You really are calling me. But Gideon doesn't do that. Right? Just the next day, he's like, okay, God, if you really want me to go, here's what we're going to do. I got this fleece, right? I got this piece of sheep's wool, and I'm going to set it out on the ground. Tomorrow when I get up, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. Okay, go. And then he wakes up the next day, ta-da, wet fleece, dry ground. And so then Gideon goes, yes, I finally believe. I have enough faith. Let's go. Eh. Yeah. What does Gideon do? He goes, Lord, don't be mad at me, um, but I, I need another sign. Really? You need another supernatural confirmation? He says, today what I want is I want uh, wet ground, dry fleece. I mean, this could have gone on forever. Why does Gideon do this? It, maybe it's that he lacks faith. Maybe it's that he lacks confidence. Or maybe he just keeps putting these impossible signs because he doesn't want to do it. I mean, I think all of that is part of why we all fight with God. Sometimes we just don't have confidence. We've been torn down or told we're stupid or we can't do it or we have no value or we're their least favorite child, whatever it might be, or our parents abandon us. We, we have all these things that go into our lack of confidence. And then we have all kinds of reasons to doubt God. Is God really going to come through? Is He really going to provide? Is He really going to speak through me? And then we just have the wrestling where it's like, I would just rather not do that. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to put my life at risk. I don't want to learn another language. And so we have that process. But look how God just responds to Gideon. Time and time again. He gives him supernatural confirmation. And there's another one. Oh, by the way, when they're spying out the camp, at the exact moment that they're down spying out the camp, he overhears one of the enemy go, I had a dream last night, and in the dream, Gideon kicked our butt. Wow, what do you know? <laughs> and so Gideon goes, okay, now, Lord, I know you're with me. Finally! <laughs> and they attack and have a tremendous victory. And then he goes and makes an ephod. But what I want to draw out with this is that Gideon encourages us that it's a normal thing to doubt. It's a normal thing to wrestle with God. It's a normal thing to doubt whether we can actually do something. When does Gideon pull the altar to bail down? At night. Another weenie move. <laughs> now, I understand that. He's going against his whole village and he's going against his father. In that culture, you do not cross your father. You just don't do that. Very similar to a lot of cultures today. You don't cross your father. That is just like the worst sin that a son could commit. So I understand his trepidation in doing that. And at least he does it though. See, we look at that and we think, wow, that was a lack of courage. But he does do it. And it's this process where it's kind of like it's obedience but his way. But at least he's doing something. At least he just doesn't go, you know what? I don't care how many supernatural signs you give me, God. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to tear down my father's altar. He, at least he does it. It's a step in the right direction. And so God blesses it. And his father doesn't kill him. And the villagers are not allowed to murder him. In fact, what his dad says is, hey, let Baal fight for himself. If Baal's really a god, let him strike my son down. If not, then shut up. Because he cares more about his son than he does Baal. Again, it kind of push comes to shove. Shows you if they're true worshipers of Baal or not. So Gideon goes and he fights this battle. And God gives him victory. And then things turn south. And as we close today, what I want us to do is kind of take a step back. And think about what I see are the two main lies that are out there today about calling. About what are you supposed to do. Because... 
as I've been in YWAM for a long time, and I go and I travel and speak, one of the number one things that people, students, and staff are wrestling with is what am I called to do? In fact, some of you may be so sick of that question. Are, are, are you sick of the question? What people group are you called to? I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, what, what's your calling and gifting? I don't know. What are you doing after DBS? I don't know. I just want to wear a sign that says, I don't know my calling. I'm not called to any people group. Leave me alone. <laughs> right? And you can just status update. And so if God tells me, I will let you know. Otherwise, stop asking. <laughs> so this is, this is really why a lot of people come to YWAM, because they don't know what they're supposed to do. They love God, and they're passionate about the lost, but they're just not sure what they're supposed to do with their whole life. I mean, that's my daughter. She's 18. She had such a hard time picking a college because she's not sure what she's supposed to do in life. She loves God. She loves helping kids. She's a solid Christian, but she's just not sure what to do with the rest of her life. That's kind of overwhelming for all of us. And so here's two big lies that we need to be very careful of. Okay, lie number one. I'm not gifted enough to do that. Or I'm not gifted in that area. And basically, this is kind of Gideon's response. And this is Moses' response. I'm not a gifted public speaker, Moses says. Aaron is. So send Aaron. Gideon, I'm not physically strong enough. I'm not from a strong enough tribe or clan. You've got to send somebody from Judah or a stronger tribe or clan. Their, their response, their initial objection is that they aren't gifted enough to do what God is calling them to do. Now, that would be a fine response, a fine objection, if there were a line of people waiting to respond to God's call. But any time that you're asked to come on staff or to lead an outreach or to be a missionary, I want you to stop for a second and look behind you. And you're going to find something. No one's there. There aren't a line of people saying, oh, oh, I want to lead that next outreach team and raise my own money to do it and, and eat weird food and sleep on the ground and take cold showers and deal with team members who are ungrateful and miss their mommies. Yeah, <laughs> sign me up. Sweet. And please don't pay me. Please, whatever you do, don't pay me. I want to do fundraising. That, there's, there's not a line of people waiting to respond to God's call because it's difficult. It's not easy. So in a perfect world where everyone is following God and using their gifting for the right reasons, then we could say, oh, that's not my area of gifting. But that's not the world we live in. The world we live in is that people are lost and going to hell. And most people don't care. And so if you care, that puts you into a very small group. And if you care enough to say, I'll do whatever it takes to lead them to Christ, it puts you in an even smaller group. And so God says, hey, if you love me and you love other people and you're willing to go, I can use anybody. I can empower them with the Holy Spirit and they can get the job done no matter what clan or tribe they're from, no matter what background they have, I can get it done. And so we need to make sure that we dismiss that lie. That lie that says, send somebody else who could do a better job. And instead says, send me. I know I'm not gifted. I know I'm not experienced. I might be really young. I've never done this. But I'm willing to go, God. And because I'm willing to go, I know you can do anything. Okay, lie number two. Lie number two. That nation, ministry, or cause is not my area of passion or gifting. So that nation or that ministry or that cause is not my area of passion or gifting. Let me just do a little illustration for you. If I came to you this morning right, and I said that the person who is over me in my church came to me and said, would you be willing to lead a relief team to Nepal? We've got all the money. We've bought the plane tickets. We've got all the aid and we just want you to lead the team to go to Nepal. What if I said, you know, I'd love to, but I'm, I'm not called to Nepal. The Lord's never told me that I'm called to go to the people of Nepal. That's not my people group. I'm called to Taiwanese people. 
that's my calling. But you know what? Hey, I tell you what, I'll put it in the bulletin. I'll just check with our church and see if there's anyone called to Nepal. Anyone called to Nepal? Anyone? No? Nope. No? Nope. Uh, hey, I'm sorry. Maybe you check with the church across the street and there'll be somebody called to Nepal. It's ridiculous, right? But we do the same thing. We do the same thing because we're not focused on the need. Let me say something and kind of stick with me for a minute. Who cares what you feel passionate about? Who cares where you feel called to? What if God had come to Othniel and said, Othniel, my people are oppressed. My people are hurting. My people are dying. Will you help out? And Othniel said, I'm called to the business world. I'd love to help you out, God. But business, that's my passion. I'm called to transform business. But I tell you what, if I find the social justice calling guy, I'll just hook you up and he can go. Othniel, it's not like he went or any of these people went because they were military experts or that was their calling. God said, my people are hurting. They're in need. Will you go? And, and I think sometimes this thing about gifting and calling, yeah, I'm not saying that God doesn't call people to the nations. I'm not saying that God doesn't call people to specific ministries. But don't allow that to stop you from helping people who are hurting and in need. If there's a need, we just go. Right? Even if it's prayer and handing out food and handing out Bibles or whatever it might be, if there's a desperate need, then we should be serving that need. And as long as we're Christians, then we're qualified to go. <laughs> right? So don't fall into that trap that you're just, you're, you're paralyzed. I've seen Christians in missions paralyzed because they're waiting for God to give them that specific word. And they tie it into this whole thing of fleecing. Right? It's even worse because well, I'm not going to do anything until I have some kind of supernatural sign to do it. So, uh, if God, if you want me to be on DBS staff, then when I get to this light, it's going to go green right now. <laughs> and so, if you really want to do it, you'll time it so that you know there's no way it's going green. But if you do want to do it, then you'll just keep going, and it's going to happen right now. No, 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 I mean right now. Three, two, one, now. Hey, it went green. God, you've called me to do this. <laughs> Like we treat this leasing like, God, should I really help this old lady across the road? Let me stop and have a prayer time. Lord Jesus, if you want me to help this old lady across the road, would you show me a sign and let the sun stop in the sky? You don't need that. Just help the old lady across the street. Lord, should I give money to help the relief effort in Nepal? Well, I need to take 40 days praying fast on that. Just give the money. Like it's a mistake. Like God's going to go, you were generous? Pff, what a loser. I didn't tell you to be generous. <laughs> yeah. Right? So don't allow this. I mean, it's ridiculous on a small scale, but it's the same thing. If, for example, there is a need in DBS for staffing, right? And you have taken the class and you can help other people learn the word and you don't have a specific plan next. And there's a need so that other people can be sitting in your place in a couple of semesters and be transformed with the Word of God and they're hungry just like you are to learn the Word and you can serve that? You, you don't need the sun to stop in the sky or the earth to split open. You serve the need. That's just an example. Yo is not paying me to say that. <laughs> Let's just go and serve and believe that God can empower us to do whatever, no matter our background, no matter what we feel we're gifted or passionate in. Hey, let's pray and we close this morning. Father God, we thank you so much that you are the hero. None of these people, none of these judges were really the hero of any of these stories, but it's you. You who raised them up, you who empowered them, you who sent them out, and you who brought victory and glory to your name. Because you had pity and compassion on the people. God, would you break our heart for what breaks yours? That, God, we wouldn't be paralyzed by a lack of confidence. We wouldn't be paralyzed by, you know, uh, just waiting and waiting and waiting for some specific calling. But we would see sheep without a shepherd and our heart would break like yours did, Lord Jesus. And we would just go out and serve. God, I pray you bless the students. God, as they continue to read through your word, would you transform their hearts and their minds? 
um, God and just give them amazing discussions this afternoon and times of prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.